this unique meditation for healing, she says, myself, Ruth, Miriam, many of the female disciples and Essenes would go to the altar. And an altar was always built in the center of Nazarene Essene communities. She would invoke the grace of surrender, bless anyone present, right? And then they would have something to represent the sun to the north, the earth to the east, the moon to the south, and the cosmos and stars to the west. So you can do that for yourself when working with surrender, when you really need this grace in your life. Just most of us, she says, need the grace of surrender, particularly when we're afraid, when we're upset, surrender is required. So you can imagine and visualize that altar being here in your soul, inside of you. And you can invigorate and bless that altar and adorn it with um, any idols, any um, roses they would typically put. They would typically put pink white or yellow roses, and sometimes all three to represent um, the power of the Trinity. So that's something that uh, she said, you can make it like my altar, or you can make it like your own. That's not important. But what she did was they had an altar. And when they couldn't be in front of the altar, they would visualize that altar because they had everything on it memorized. So there was a wooden altar. And it had on a red, a crimson or scarlet red cloth. It had um, something to represent the sun at the north of the altar, the earth to the east, the moon to the south, and the cosmos and stars to the west. So you can just put something on your altar to represent that. They typically utilize elements um, for that sort of thing, like like fire would represent the sun and a bowl of um, earth would represent earth, right? And then you can choose what you want, like water for moon and air for stars or cosmos was typically what um, she and Miriam and Ruth often used, she says. And they would put that to the north, the south, the east, and the west, those symbols. And they would ask that the grace of surrender activate, cleanse, and purify the seven seals. What they mean by that is the chakras. And they would wait. In this case, they wouldn't sit and attempt. She explains that they didn't sit and attempt to um, do certain breath practices in this way. Oftentimes, there would be no chanting. There would be a quiet, contemplative meditation, right? a very quiet contemplative meditation without setting forth anything but this original intention of invoking the grace of surrender, having that north, south, east, and west and everything on your altar for the symbol. And then they would just contemplate what they need to surrender, why they need to surrender, what pain they're experiencing. And they would imagine, she says, we would imagine putting our suffering on that altar, putting our pain on the altar, every specific guilt or shame or anger or wrath or envy, sloth, anything that we needed to let go of. It was in lacking of service of our path. We would place that energy on that altar, place that feeling on that altar. Right. Um, And that contemplative practice would sometimes, she said, a scenes would sit around and do this for hours until every burden was lifted from them, until they no longer felt burdens. So people who experience the dark night of the soul, which was really common for Israel in this time, um, really wanted this practice to, to come out of the darkness more. Um, let's see, I wanted to talk about the soul's ancient traditions that she says you can remember as well, because even though she says, even though we use different 
holy language for the words to describe these traditions, you're doing similar things, but simply using different words. When you can use the words that we use, which contain the great seals of righteousness, and we will discuss that when you get to the Qumran community, um, because they knew a lot about the seals of righteousness. Um, and that wasn't a religious thing. Um, you can use these holy words and it will bring forth that deep download into your soul of the original energy that the holy language in this wording carried, right? But you're doing the same thing and you're using different words and she's, she's not implying that your words are lesser in energy. It's just different. And if you want um, the original, ancient, powerful, traditional experience um it's fun to just learn something different sometimes when we can just not assume that we know everything about things but just go in with a wonder and um sort of a, a trust and just a curiosity about these ancient traditions it can really fill our lives and teach us beyond what we think we know it, it can be humbling she says <laughs> um so Let's start. There are six ancient traditions of the soul in the Nazarene Essene community that were taught to Anna. So the first thing that they worked on was completion. And completion is an ancient tradition when you learn to hold space for closing your own past lifetimes. And eventually you can do that for others. So some people work in the Akashic records and do that. They called them the life records. So in, in anything that was coming up in your life, there could be a parallel lifetime or a, as you call a past lifetime um, that you need to complete or close. Otherwise, you're going to carry over fears that just don't make any sense. Um, you know how some people are born with um, really irrational fears or you think it's an irrational fear until you become aware of where it comes from in other lifetimes. Um, Anna's community were keenly aware of how to get completion for that for every lifetime that you could be carrying through. Um... The second one, the second of the soul's ancient traditions in her community was called activation. So it's for people who want to activate their own awakening and possibly activate awakenings in others. We would call uh, them activators, right? Um, her initial word was initiator, but that's just so general. You're actually awakening someone in a certain activation so they worked with etheric dna the soul's dna and sometimes that could affect the body um she said if goddess um felt in her divine will that that was something you chose to activate and heal the body then that would happen if not it would work on the mind and the soul so activation and then from there, they were taught the ancient tradition of light craft. Light craft is for those who hold humanity to the remembrance of both universal law and cosmic law. So they would start with basic universal law and move on to cosmic law when a person got a good grasp of that. So light craft um, traditions were typically held by teachers in the community. But you had to have completion for yourself and know how to help someone else with completion. You had to know how to activate yourself and activate someone else in order to go on to the third initiation of light craft. And that's um, remembering and holding to universal law and cosmic law. Um, number four, sometimes you got this initiation, but sometimes you didn't. It really would depend upon your readiness, she said. So that's the initiation of the keeping. And the person was called the keeper. So these are beings who hold and keep sacred teachings holy and true. So that the darkness cannot touch it, she says. 
So some people that that was very, a few got it and, and many didn't. Not required. Um, it was more like a calling, she said, for those who hold that. And they have to carry it through lifetime after lifetime. So it's a deep commitment um, to receive that initiation because then you vow. It's a literal vow and a scene's held vows to be very um, strong. If you vowed something, it's permanent in every lifetime. Marriage is a vow. So you would commit yourself to further lifetimes with that person, according to the Essene view, anytime you had a vow. So you have to vow to keep the holy ways in every lifetime and to keep these teachings pure. Um, number five, healers. The healers of the community. Um, and don't confuse it with the medicine holder. She said, that's number six. Not, not every healer holds medicine. You had to go through all of the initiations to hold medicine, including being a keeper to become a holder of sacred medicine. But number five was a healer of any kind. Um, and you know what healers do? They bless people. They hold the keys of powerful blessings and know what blessing you need. Um, Healers were those who led a very virtuous, pure lifestyle. Healers, she says, healers didn't eat meat. Um, healers um, did not focus on any impure energy so or any undefiled, any defiled energy. Um, so if they ate food, they would have to purify it if it was impure. But most of the time, meat was just considered unholy and impure. So they did not eat meat. Um the healers didn't. A lot of other people did, and they would just bless it. Um, the only, they, they didn't eat pork. They were kosher. I mean, they were Jews, <laughs> but they ate a lot of other meat. They just blessed it. The healers were the ones that couldn't. Healers and medicine holders don't eat meat. And sometimes keepers don't, but that's a personal choice, she said. Um, so it's a sacred lifestyle of making sure that everything that you see and you hear and that you take in is blessed and pure. Um, people aren't allowed to say anything negative to keepers, healers, and medicine holders because it defiles their path and, and frightens them. And they have to like undo things about themselves. And they've had like so many initiations. So they have to live a very holy life. So you have to be really traditionally respectful and reverent around keepers, healers, and medicine holders in her time. Um, she was a keeper, a healer, and a medicine woman, and she was held in great reverence in her community, although she's very humble, and um, she says uh, anyone could commit to it <laughs> if they wanted. Um, Medicine holders, she said it could be medicine of light, medicine of sound, or medicine of the land. So if you were an elemental medicine person, you worked with essence and sometimes land and elements from earth, right? Um, you could work with vibrational medicine if you wished, right? Or you could work strictly with light craft and light and light medicine. It's completely up to you. Many medicine holders in her time worked with all of it, right? So those are all the teachings. Now she's going to answer questions and get deeper into some channelings with you. So remember, you can vote up. Got a few people who have voted up at the same number. So if you guys don't mind going in there and doing that for me, that would be exceptional. And much, and much appreciated. Thank you. Lisa, you got voted up. <laughs> um, let's see. 